Hey, hey. Welcome to the podcast, folks. Thanks for joining me. Saturday, June 23rd, 2018, overcast day in Bucks County. A nice day to drink coffee. I have a large coffee from McDonald's. Truth be told, I already had a cup of coffee this morning, so this is number two, and we'll see how it goes. One would think the more coffee he drinks, the funnier the podcast will be, but I don't know if there's a direct equation between coffee consumption and humor level. Sometimes I'll overdo it with the coffee. After two large cups of coffee, truthfully, my personality can sometimes shift into a sense of feeling dread and doom. Too much caffeine. It starts to work the other way, and I start to feel a desperation, like, let me get off this ride. (laughs) But... We'll see. So far, so good. The coffee from McDonald's, I will say this, is scalding hot. I can barely, barely sip it. Wasn't that a lawsuit years ago? Didn't a woman sue McDonald's because her coffee was too hot? I agree with her. I would get in on that. A class action lawsuit against McDonald's on the cup. It says Mc, McCafe. Because it's a cafe, as well as a fine eating restaurant. <laughs> People turn their nose up at McDonald's, and as do I, but there's one right around the corner, so occasionally I will find my way there, but I will deny it. Please, McDonald's, that thing is an eyesore. Then you'll see me there sometimes. Welcome to the podcast. A couple contacts, a couple questions people had, a couple comments from the last podcast that I will open uh, and address. The first one being... A question, do I play that guitar riff in the beginning? The guitar riff that you heard. The question is yes. Actually, the answer. The answers are when you answer the thing. The answer is yes. Uh, I have my guitar on me. It's this, this little riff right here that I made up. That boy. That boy is a little blues progression. A little blues. I know when you say progression, it makes you seem like a a real musicologist. Uh, That's a blues progression on the pentonic scale. Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. But, uh, yeah, man. So, I do jam out a bit. I do play one of my other hobbies. And I really didn't know what sort of music you could use in a podcast because there are issues of copyright infringement and intellectual property. So I didn't want to steal another person's song for this podcast in case it hits the big time and I lose it all. But let's be honest, really, I just was looking for another outlet to play guitar. Um, So this accomplished that. So if I'll put the guitar away for now. Oh, God, he's got the guitar. He's the guy at the party with the guitar. Uh, But if anyone is uh, interested in getting together to jam out there in the world of... um, this audience. It was over 250 downloads right now, this audience quietly, quietly making some some headway. I don't even know how to judge 250. Is that is that large? Is that small? I have no context. I don't know how the internet works. I believe we're at Joe Rogan level at this point. He's a famed podcastian. Um, sip of McDonald's. Oh, that's hot. That is hot. Out there and you want to jam, I always have in my head that I'd like to start a punk rock band. I know, he's 42, sad, but I do. So if you're out there, I would say uh, influ- my influences in this band that I envision would be Minor Threat, uh, Bad Brains, anything along the lines of 80s punk rock, which I consider the golden era of punk rock, you know. Screw Reagan! If you're really against Reagan, uh, hang out. We'll we'll play, and we'll. Uh, I would love to uh, play at a ball. I, I don't want to be like the lead punk band. Like I want to be on a bill with eight other punk bands, and I would like to play six. Just I'm perfectly content with just being mixed in the middle somewhere. That's where I am in life now. I'm, just, I'm fine 
with not being the headline. I just want to just want to be that just want to be on the field coach. I don't have to be the captain, just put me in. I I do think of punk band names occasionally and I write them on my phone. So I find that sometimes projects work best when you start with the end in mind. So I already have the name. All you have to do is come jam with me. Here are some potential names. I think uh, I think we got some winners here. Seven hundred level. Little play on the uh, thought of the Eagles rowdy crowd section back at Veteran Stadium. But I think that'd be a cool punk band name. Seven hundred level. How about House Arrest? Too aggressive. Good. Boot Camp. Get it the pun because like Doc Martin boots boot camp. Street drugs. Propane. P R O hyphen P A I N. P A I N. Get it? Pain. Concussed. Concussed. That might be a good one. Heartworm. Heart now I envision heartworm being sort of a uh, a punk country outfit. Kind of a, with a rockabilly influence. Heartworm. Razor blade toothbrush. Too much. Trying too hard, that one, maybe. The lunatic fringe. Also, that one feels like it's trying too hard. Dead finger. Dead finger. I think has has potential. And gutter snipe. When I go through this list, it's heartworm that really uh, sticks out the most. We would probably be heartworm, and we would have a country influence. So contact me. I will say I'm into it, and then probably gradually not contact you back. Only because of me. Because of me. Because of uh, social issues. I'll be like, oh, do I really want to do that? I was high on coffee when I said that. Do I really feel like hanging out? No, I think I do. I think I do. Contact me. That's what I do. I write things down on my phone. People have asked, how do you do the podcast? Well, I have jokes, observations, things that I notice in life, and I write them down on the phone in the notes section of my phone. And then I, I scroll through the phone, and I see the jokes. And I chuckle to myself and I think, hmm, what jokes would fit together? It's like a jigsaw puzzle, folks. And, you know, some jokes have the potential to run for 10 minutes. Others are just brief observations that really can't go uh, any length of time beyond just stating them. So I see where they fit together. I usually pick about three broad range topics. You know, you've been, I don't have to explain this to you. And that's uh, that's to answer someone else's question, how do I come up with the topics? That's it. From observation to phone to jotting a couple of the words down, just the words. I uh, don't want to script it. This is light, lightly scripted fun. Lightly scripted fun. I have a couple of the words. And, and that's a podcast. That's how it works. That's how we do. Someone also said they enjoyed my Northeast Philly impression, or maybe just my Philly impression. I see it from the Northeast, though. Uh, maybe that's what this show needs as well, as I try to find a, a center for the podcast, a spiritual center, maybe more accents, impressions, and zany characters, not unlike a morning zoo. You just like that, that Philly impression? We could see. Now when I try to do it, I can't it, when you overthink it. But I do have some accents. I have an Irish accent, but the, th- the problem with my Irish accent is it, it, it starts to slip into my pirate accent, matey. And you come on board. And I start an accent drinking a Guinness at the pub with the lads, and I finish it on some pirate ship looking for booty. And I never know what, when that transition will happen. Now, if there were a, uh, a role for me in a voiceover for a character that is an Irish pirate, I think I'd be a fantastic candidate for that. You could do some British, too. I'm kind of a bloke that knows a couple British things. Or do I? I don't know. 
every day. I, my daughter, she, she's got a Beatles shirt, and I say, name the four Beatles, and she doesn't remember them. She knows John and Paul. <laughs> no, I can't remember. And George. But Ringo, she always forgets Ringo. It's true. And, you know, really, she should not wear a Beatles shirt if she can't wear all four Beatles and name all four Beatles. Right? Shouldn't that be the criteria of wearing a shirt? She was also wearing a Guns N' Roses shirt the other day. Not only can, does she not know a Guns N' Roses song, maybe she knows one. She doesn't know the members of that band, too. I told this to someone the other day, and they said, well, do you know all the members of Guns N' Roses? I said, hmm, hmm. Certainly Axel and Slash. But then it gets a little foggy, doesn't it? Izzy Stradlin? Duff Mc, McKeegan? And then I believe there were five piece, and I cannot remember that fifth member of Guns N' Roses. So perhaps my calling her a poser was too harsh because maybe you don't need to name all the members of the band. But three. Three should do it. And Ringo, really. Ringo. I feel like this podcast is like Ringo sort of podcast. <laughs> Um, so use like the Northeast Philly accents that the, the comment about the Northeast Philly, see the thing is when you get a couple Miller lights in you and you just want to talk about the birds and, uh, in my neighborhood, there are, there are people from Northeast Philly, but there are also Russians. We have Russian. This is bordering on ethnic humor. This is probably not a route I want to go down, right? I think Northeast Philly accents, it's the only one you can, like, joke around with without fear of retribution. Uh, that other accents, you start, I think humor would not be a good a good direction of this podcast. Uh, so I won't get into my Russian accent uh, for fear of treading on toes, but that's one of the accents as well. Northeast Philly. 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 Did If you don't know, if you haven't heard, the Philadelphia Eagles have won the Super Bowl. It's a couple months now since it's happened, and I still cannot wrap my brain around it. I'm so happy, so excited still. It doesn't make sense. Two things that I cannot wrap my brain around. Trump won the election, and the Eagles have won the Super Bowl. Both are like, did that really happen? Did it really happen? I'm overjoyed about the Eagles. I can't. I was in San Diego a couple months ago for a work meeting, and as soon as we sat down, the person conducting the meeting said, well, first of all, uh, congratulations on your Philadelphia Eagles. I was like, thank you. Thank you. Yes, that is how all meetings should begin from now on, if, if you're coming from out of town. Congratulate me on my football team, and then we'll conduct business. I like the, uh, the respect, the inherent respect of the fantastic Eagles. I still like sometimes have a catch in my throat when I talk about them. Like, all right, I'm not going to cry, but it's just a little catch sometimes happen. Like, <sighs> unbelievable. Unbelievable. I have loved the Eagles since, I don't know, fourth grade, third grade, the Buddy Reiner and the uh, Rich Kotite, Ray Rhodes, Andy Reid, now Doug Peterson, whom I believe would be a company man, Doug Peterson. I thought this was a very uh, Mr. Milktoast sort of hire, but he's proven to be unbelievably creative, courageous, and just a phenomenal coach, Doug. Doug, when they won that night, man, it was just, I was at the neighbor's. I was actually back and forth. I, wa I wanted to be everywhere at once. I was with the family a little bit. I ran up the street uh, a couple couple houses up, was watching with the neighbor. And I, so the game concluded when they beat those loathsome Patriots. When it concluded and the Eagles won the Super Bowl, I, I went out after some, some hugging and jumping around and cheering. I went outside alone. And I started to walk towards my house, and I just felt myself, this, this scream came out of me, this guttural howl, this cathartic just bellow at the moon, like 42 years of disappointment, anxieties, uh, almost, just 
all disappeared in that scream. It was the most amazing feeling of my life. Yeah, yeah excluding you know, birth of kids and marriage and whatever else you're supposed to say. But it was unbelievable. I've seen, uh, I've, I've been to a number of Eagles games over the years, as have you. Uh, my favorite one, I think, was in the early 2000s. Uh, I went with some friends down to Miami to see the Eagles play the Dolphins. And we spent the weekend down there in South Beach. And when you travel with a large pack of Eagles fans, it's quite a sociological uh experiment. Well, I remember having a cocktail on the sidewalk on South Beach and watching a roving band of Eagles fans like a plague uh, walk down the main drag in South Beach. And you could just see the contrast between the beautiful people of Miami, the tanned, the toned, the model types versus the jarring, pasty, Bloated cholesterol, excited, insane, awesome Eagles fans coming down the street. I was never so proud to be from Philadelphia than watching that ball of cholesterol roll down the street. Miller lights in hand, Marlboro lights in hand, and uh, it was literally like a plague. You could see the fear in these Miami residents that, my goodness, this city is going to burn. But Eagles won. Nothing burned. Uh, but I'm very, Eagles make me very proud to be from Philadelphia. I have civic pride, particularly after this win. But I, you know, I've been to a number of Eagles game and Eagles tailgates. I've the Eagles tailgate is by far the most debaucherous thing that I've ever witnessed. And I've been to Grateful Dead shows, fish shows, other types of concerts and campout situations which seemingly would showcase the heart of darkness in humanity. Uh, but nothing, nothing compares to the decadence of an Eagles tailgate. Another thing that makes me proud. So they won, which means they got the last pick in the draft. That's how the NFL works. You come in first place, you get the last pick in the draft. Mixed emotions. Sometimes I want the first. Maybe it's draft night more exciting. Um, and I stayed up all night to watch that draft, and uh, they get the last pick, and they trade it down. You wait all night to find out who they're going to pick, and they trade it down. What if you just kept trading down? What would happen? Would the commissioner eventually say, look, you got to pick someone? I love the strategy. It's a very conservative strategy. Just keep trading down. That's saying, I've seen everyone on the table, and I'm not impressed. I'm going to keep trading down. I... Went to high school with and played football with the current NFL head coach, Sean McDermott, who is the head coach of the Buffalo Bills. Now, when I say I played football with Sean at LaSalle High School, I will qualify this by saying I, as a defensive back, got in the game periodically when the game was well in hand or when the game was lost, whereas Sean played every snap of every single down and single-handedly took over games and won them. Sean's senior year, I remember he was our quarterback, our middle linebacker, and even our punter. I don't recall him having great foot skills, soccer skills to be a punter, but he had such um, intensity that he just willed himself to be the greatest punter on the team as well. <laughs> he was 
an interesting, a scary dude. Now I say this because he, there's no way he'll remember me, but but he certainly made an impression on me. Dude did not smile. Dude was the most intense guy I've ever met. I'm still scared talking about him now. Very nice. I mean, a nice dude. Again, I he wouldn't remember. I made him laugh a couple times. I think that was the only uh, only impression that I may have made on him. And I maybe I, in the weight room I spotted him. You need you need me to spot you, Sean. I got you, Sean. What do you, you you're gonna up the reps? Good call. Good call, dude. Nice. I got you. That was a, that was a great spotter. As soon as I see someone starting to struggle with that weight, bam! I would slide right in there. I wasn't a great football player. I was a great locker room guy. A lot of good locker room banter. No team was going to get too tense when I was around. But Sean, that guy was that guy was a beast. I wish him the best in the NFL. He's already having a great NFL career as a defensive coordinator in Philly and now the head coach of the Buffalo Bills. So kudos, fellow LaSalle High School alumni. Wish you the best. My high school football career was less um, storied, less noteworthy. Although I would like to tell you about the greatest play that I had while playing high school football. As I mentioned, I was a defensive back, a cornerback, and one particular game, I believe against Pensbury, I forget the team. Actually, I remember every single detail, but I won't make it seem so pathetic that I'm that guy telling high school football stories. Cornerback, me, lined out, uh, lined up wide with the receiver on the sideline. Snap, quarterback drops back. I read his eyes. I see him look to my receiver, and it's like a 10-yard out, and I jump the route. I jump the route, and that ball was coming at me, and I was like, this is it. It's going to happen. Interception time, baby. That ball is getting closer and closer. I catch the thing, and for some reason, with nobody in front of me, with nothing but Grass and six points the other way with quick pick six. I catch the thing and just drop straight to the ground and curl into the fetal position. Why did I do that? Why did I just drop like there's not a moment, a day that goes by in which at some point throughout the day, I don't think, why didn't I just run that in for a touchdown? It would have been a dramatic like 30 yard return. Why did I just drop into the fetal position? I think I was so fixated on catching the ball that once I ensured the catch that I just lost control of of body, of a limb. It was so much concentration that I couldn't move. Uh, But I did. I did get an interception. So that would have to be my greatest sporting accomplishment. Until recently, I had a good sporting accomplishment recently. A couple months ago, we had uh, a 5K race around here, and I run periodically, and a number of neighborhood dads signed up, and I won the neighborhood dad 5K. Uh, Well, there were thousands of people involved in this, but I was specifically competing against like three other dudes. And uh, the deal was, this was my trick to winning the race, and hopefully they don't listen to this podcast, because I might try it again this upcoming uh, September when the race happens again. I, first mile, we were neck and neck, sort of drafting one another, like a bunch of uh, knowledgeable grizzly vets in a NASCAR race. And then I I said, I can maintain this pass with them, uh, this pace with them, but I must think about when am I going to make my move. So about the mile and a half mark, I noticed that the course does a hard right in which the distance up ahead is more or less a blind spot. It's shielded by homes and businesses, and I figured this is it. This is where I'm going to pounce. So I turned to these other gentlemen who were not winded. They were seemingly had a good amount of stamina left. 
And I said, all right, time for me to win this thing. And with that, I sprinted as fast as I could to this blind spot bend around the turn. And I didn't look back. And now I knew strategically I could not maintain this pace. But what I wanted to do was give the illusion to them that I could. In other words, to break their spirit. So, gunned it around the turn, and that's the last I saw of my two foes. I kept looking back. I thought they'd make a move, but nothing. And then, when I victoriously finished the race, uh, they thought that I had maintained that sprinter's pace. But in truth, I came back down to reality. But it was just enough of a head fake, just enough strategery as they say, to win the Run Now, Wine Later, New Hope 5K amongst my competitors. Maybe the satisfying moment was one of the neighborhood dads panting, defeated, saying in front of my children, I know, Brian, you ran fast, but I just couldn't catch you. I said, can you repeat that in front of my wife and kids? Can you just say that same exact phrase again? Because they were a little distracted. The part about you not being able to catch me. Is there anything more primal than winning a foot race? Is there anything more pure? So, I am in training now for the next race. And I also know, so are other people gunning for me this year. It's tough to be on top, folks. It's a lot of pressure. Myself, like the Eagles... Now cannot sneak up on anyone. People know that we are sort of the team, the squad to beat. Um, so what else? I don't really play football anymore. I do bring the football occasionally to staff barbecues and little cookouts and things. I tr- always try to get a football toss going. I'll say this. If you ever bring a football to a barbecue, the joy level at that barbecue will instantly go up 20%. The people will say, oh, football. Yeah, sure, I'll throw a football. And then you suddenly realize, boy, I haven't thrown a football in a while. Boy, this is fun. So do that at your next party. Bring a football And I guarantee that party will be more fun. I like to do it at work because I like to showcase my former football skills um, because I like a rigged game. I like to showcase things in which I know I'm fairly skilled with. Oh, oh, you can't throw a spiral, buddy? Hmm. What a shame. Let me throw a spiral 20 yards in front of some of the female staff members. You know. Not happily married, but it's 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 a primal thing. Let me showcase my skills. Oh, that's a shame about that that lame wobbling duck you just threw. Let me show you how it's done, buddy. I mean, why don't you throw a ten yard, run a ten yard? At, I can't talk. It's the second cup of coffee. Bring a football to your next BBQ, and you will be the hero. Of the party. I don't play football anymore. The last time I played football was Sega Genesis College Football 1996. That's probably the last time I played a video game, too. Like, seriously played a video game. I dabble when the kids ask me to play something, but on the whole, not a video game guy. I retired around 1996 playing video games. Do you still play? Are you a video game person? Video games. To quote Lana Del Rey. I myself am not. I have retired from video games and really haven't looked back since. I remember playing uh, 1996 Sega Genesis college football and thinking at the time, These are the greatest graphics I will ever see. It is like looking into, uh, 
It's like watching an actual football game. There will never be a time in which these graphics can be improved upon because Sega Genesis 1996 college football is the pinnacle of all gaming. I really thought that. I really thought this is amazing, and it was amazing at the time. Clearly, video games have evolved since then. I was wrong. The graphics have improved. Sega Genesis was when I got out of the game, in the gaming world. Prior to that, I had Nintendo and then the Atari 400 and the Atari 2600. Um, the most influential video game in my life was uh, one by Nintendo called Rygar. Rygar, R-Y-G-A-R. If you're a player, you know that this is bringing back Freudian memories for you. I invested so much time in this adventure quest game, seeking grappling hooks, um, bantering with Buddhist statues. This game was a world unto itself, a labyrinth in which I was lost for months. It was fascinating. It really... Uh, connected with my boyhood need for adventure, Rygar. And I won the game, and it's probably one of the few video games in which I've actually won. That, and maybe Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, which was another monumental game. But uh, winning Rygar, I mean, that was right up there with the Eagles winning the Super Bowl in terms of just it ripped back my skull and was like, whoa, my mind was blown. Maybe you recall Rygar and the strange psychedelic world in which uh, one existed whilst playing this game. Zelda was another one that kind of had a deep labyrinth feel to it, but I never... Never quite uh, connected with that game. Another one, Might and Magic, that had some uh, allure to it. I got fairly deep in that. And for the Atari 2600, the game Adventure was surprisingly intellectual despite its rudimentary graphics. I believe as the main character, you were merely a square, just a square that navigated different screens. But within those screens... There was a lot to think about, and when those dragons were released from the castle, I felt true fear. You would get swallowed by the dragon and then live there and be locked in this screen for infinity until you hit reset. So uh, those were sort of games that shaped my Freudian years. I guess how Fortnite is shaping my children's years today. I kept those uh, game systems uh, for a number of years. The Atari 2600 I held on to for 20 years or so. Same with the Atari 400 or was it 700? I recall one of my earliest dates with my wife. We uh, returned from uh, having some beverages at a bar and got into uh, a bit of Atari. And I think the thing that won me over was watching, won me over to this, to this romance, to this uh, pending nuptials, was admiring the way she played Kaboom. The Atari 2600 video game Kaboom. This one, if you recall, required not the regular joystick, but in fact paddles. And I remember watching with admiration the speed in which she caught the bombs that were dropped by the villain in this narrative with her basket. She would weave her basket back and forth with that um, with that paddle. <laughs> That is my impression of her catching these bombs. I, she got to a level that was so high, I couldn't even see the bombs being dropped. It was just a blur and... And at that moment, I thought, this is the one for me. Sold. So, alas, my kids will never know the joy of Kaboom and Atari. But 
they're mutilating people on Fortnite. So I guess everything is a trade-off, right? All right, folks. Going to try to keep it 36 minutes. So we are pretty much there. I may not, you may not hear from me again until the middle of July off to Greece. Uh, I will tell everyone you said hi and uh, just listen to the former episodes if you get sad. Just review the previous episodes until I return or get out there. It's a great big world out there. Get out there. Enjoy it. Contact me, Beast, uh, Brian Francis podcast at outlook.com. And thanks for listening. I'll see you. When I see you, bye-bye.